the school bulletin board at the administration building transmitted to the courier post philadelphia inquirer and the clerk of cherry hill township please stand with me for the pledge of allegiance i pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america and to the republic for which it stands one nation under god indivisible with liberty and justice for all and I'll now turn it over to Mrs. Sugars for roll call. Mrs. Arroyo? Here. Mrs. Stratton? Here. Ms. Rydell? Here. Mrs. Matlack? Here. Mr. Avadia? Here. Mrs. Schultz? Here. Ms. Stern? Here. Mrs. Tong? Mrs. Neary? Here. Okay, and that will now bring us, we have no board of recognition this evening and no presentation. So that'll bring us to the administrative reports and I will turn it over to Dr. Malash. Thank you, Mrs. Neary. Good, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's nice to see you all tonight here in person and online as we begin our final board meeting of October. We're almost two months through the school year. Um, Dr. Morton and Dr. Mahan and I uh, are excited to bring you updates uh, on the road forward as we have the presentation is set and appears like it is ready to go. And Dr. Mahan, you're doing the slide. Perfect. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so this evening, as we go through the presentation, uh, we do have some pretty focused updates uh, about what's going on with the road forward as we are coming, as I said, to the end of October uh, and the end of the second full month of school. It's been incredibly exciting times. It's been so wonderful to have students back in all of our schools uh, and regular schedules um, throughout the course of the days. There's been a lot of learning, uh, also a lot of getting reacclimated and transitioning back into school. So we're going to start again as we do, uh, focusing uh, for everybody, and we do this internally when we talk about items, we go through our planning and we do our work. Uh, we're doing it with the community and the board to focus on our mission, our goals, and our commitments. We're going to talk about how things are going. Uh, we're going to talk about the emergency virtual plan. A big part and the focus of the presentation this evening will be about um, the emergency uh, remote instruction virtual plan that we have to submit to the state this Friday. Our road forward committee, which Dr. Morton will get into and talk about, uh, has invested a considerable amount of time in preparing that plan. Uh, we'll ask the board, we'll, we'll act on it tonight. We'll deliver that information this evening. And then any questions and uh, questions from the board and answers that we'll be able to provide. So again, first, our district mission statement, always a critical item for all of us to know, be familiar with, uh, and be able to focus on, something that keeps us grounded in all that we do. We have highlighted over the course of the last uh, nearly 20 months at this point, um, that line in an ever-changing world. Uh, when this mission statement was redeveloped uh, about five years ago, five and a half years ago now, uh, the discussions that went into it with our alumni and with our staff members and our students, it was very important to them at that time that the skills that students developed and what they learned while they were here as part of the school district um, would allow them to, fr to thrive in an ever-changing world. And the way the things have gone in our world the last few years, ever-changing is certainly uh, very appropriate. We have three strategic goals that were adopted by the board in February of 2020. These are the umbrellas under which we define and identify uh, the district goals in terms of what we're doing, uh, where we're going towards, and what those actions are that we are looking to take uh, each of the individual years. And we focused them in three specific areas after we went through and got a lot of feedback from members of the community, uh, both through surveys and small group instructions, focus groups, uh, and discussions with, with uh, an overarching committee. Strategic goals focus on student wellness, purpose and passion, and connecting beyond our classrooms. Again, that theme, connecting beyond our classrooms, purpose and passion for our kids and student wellness. These are the commitments uh, that we started talking about and articulating back in the spring of 2021. 
uh, which in some ways seems like it was a long time ago, uh, but about seven, seven and a half months ago as we started to prepare for our transition into the fall, into September of 2021. These are the items that we identified in our work that the district was making commitments uh, to in terms of moving forward. These we believe remain incredibly important and we like to remind ourselves and folks within the community, this is what the district is committed to. The health and safety of our students and staff, regularly scheduled school days for all students, breakfast and lunch being available and scheduled for students, and working in partnership with the New Jersey Department of Ed, the New Jersey Department of Health, and the Camden County Department of Health to remain informed about the status of community health. And finally, communicating information transparently with students, families, staff members, and community. So how are things going? Right, That's one of the things we hear a lot. What's happening? How are things going? Uh, and honestly, in a word, well. So some pictures that Dr. Morton uh, put together for us uh, that, that have come off of uh, social media for the district, uh, as well as some of the individual schools that have shared information. Uh, and it's a great place to see both on Instagram, on Twitter, um, some quick snapshots about things that are taking place. We've had book fairs at most of our elementary schools. You can see students as they do their work and they're shining uh, in terms of what they're doing. Shining Sharks, that's from Woodcrest. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Morton, I think, right? Yes, yes, thank point. you so much, uh, you, Dr. Malash. Definitely appreciate it. So uh, emer emergency virtual or remote instruction plan. So this, this plan uh, was put together uh, by the Road Forward Committee and Road Forward Elementary, uh, Middle, uh, High, and Special Education Subcommittees. It was truly a collaborative effort. And as I took part in the process, um, I, I just really uh, had to reflect on how grateful and appreciative I am to work in a community where people are so passionate about children, uh, from parents to faculty members, uh, to teachers and, and students themselves as well who that participated. We had two high school students participate on the high school committee as well. Uh, it, it was really something to behold um, as we went through. So uh, just as a, as a reminder, so the whole, whole road, road Forward Committee met twice last month. They met on the 4th to begin the process of laying out our virtual uh, remote plan. Um, and then it will follow in, in the next week by the subcommittee meetings. Special Education Subcommittee met on October 13th, elementary on the 12th and the 20th. Uh, they probably put in five to six hours uh, of time and, and meeting time and trying to craft the plan together. Uh, middle level met on October 13th, high school met on October 14th. And then we followed up as a whole committee on October 18th to consolidate all of the information and to co consolidate the plans. So the components of the plan, there, were, there are three required areas that the state requires. Um, the first part had to do with internet access and technology availability. The next part, meal access and availability. And then the next part, the last, the final part was the length of the virtual or remote instruction day. So for internet access and technology, essentially we need to ensure as a district that all students have ex access to a technology uh, based device and that students that students or families who also need internet access uh, that there's connectivity as well so uh, there's a responsibility on the school district uh, to make sure that those 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 needs are met um, we have taken the adequate steps to meet those needs in the past um, devices were provided to provide internet access as were uh, chromebooks or laptops that were provided as well and we'll continue to do the same in the event that we are required to shut down. Uh, the question may arise as to how students may uh, go about accessing a, a device if they need one, and it's simple. So students can contact the building principal um, and you know, to reach out and request a device. So meal access and availability. So again, uh, as, as we provide meals every day in school, we need to be able to mirror that as well in the event that we are on a uh, full closure. In the event of, school, of a full closure, uh, meals will be available at specific locations throughout the district. Um, something that was very, very important, and that was, that was discussed quite a bit 
during the row forward meetings was this idea of increasing access to meals. Uh, I won't mention specifically what was, what was stated, but just ideas for increasing access and how we can, as a district, uh, provide more of our students and our families with meals um, in the most convenient manner possible. So we're committed to that. We're committed to you know, consistently exploring creative options for allowing that access to take place. Uh, something else that has to be mentioned, students on out of district placements uh, may retrieve meals from their schools as well. In the event of closure of one, but not all of the schools or just a few of the schools, uh, meals will be distributed at a specific time from that school. Um, communication obviously would occur um, at, the, at, at, the, at the present time um, based upon what the circumstances are. Sorry, we're passing the microphone back here. So the final section of the plan includes length of the virtual or remote instruction day. And some of the information that we took from the previous plan, um, as Dr. Morton said, there was a significant amount of conversation regarding the length of the day and how would we process feedback that we received with the original return to learn plan, now translating that into the road forward plan in the event that we do have to go virtual or remote. So the length of the school day has been broken down in this presentation into preschool, elementary school, middle school, and high school. The length of the instructional day varies by grade level and age. Students across all levels will participate in synchronous live instruction on a daily basis with their teachers. And then for our upper elementary and secondary students, there may be asynchronous projects which students will need to complete um, by themselves. And then lastly, similar to the previous school closures, teachers will communicate specifics regarding the daily student classroom schedule and topics that will be covered. Here is the sample of the remote learning day schedule for Barclay Early Childhood Center. It includes professional learning community time for teachers in the morning, as in all of our elementary schools from 8.15 until 8.45. For the half-day program, students would participate from 9 to 11.30. For the PM program, 1 to 3.30. Or the full-day program, 9 until 2.30. Components for the Barclay Early Childhood Program include full class virtual meetings, access to their encore classes, the continued implementation of creative curriculum, large group instruction, educational assistance support in small group and one-on-one, -on -one, as well as conferring and feedback and access to a variety of visual techniques such as boom cards, PowerPoints, interactive games and multimedia to significantly increase engagement for our students. When we think about our elementary students, students in kindergarten through fifth grade, this chart will show you um, the different grade levels and then each of the content areas that occur during the academic day and the time allocated for each. I cannot emphasize enough that during the academic day in the classroom, teachers are not standing in front of the class and providing direct instruction for six and a half hours. There are a variety of opportunities to, for students to work in small groups, to have independent practice, to participate in group work, to confer with their teachers, as well as to have direct instruction. So although the time allocations are here and divided by content area, please keep that in mind when you look at this schedule. So again, the components of the elementary schedule, as I already mentioned, different instructional methods, utilizing direct instruction, guided instruction, guided practice, independent practice, small group instruction and conferring. The academic day will be live streamed with synchronous instruction for our students. And we will be following a more traditional schedule at the elementary school in the event of a school closure that is from nine to 3.30. As you saw on the previous slide, time allocations for each content area and learning activity are designated and will be implemented 
in a fashion that is developmentally and age appropriate. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Morton. Thank you, Dr. Mahan. Uh, so at, at the middle school level, the, the schedule is pretty straightforward. I think uh, what was what was abundantly clear from all committees was that uh, we, we, we didn't want to have students take a step back in terms of rigor, in terms of um, their academic approach. Uh, so the, the intention was to try to mirror um, our, our day schedule as much as possible. So as you'll see, uh, straight eight schedule with advisory, uh, counting as one of those periods, but an 8 a.m. start and at 3 p.m. Conclusion. So middle school students will also participate in live stream synchronous instruction daily. Uh, as mentioned, the, the class schedule will uh, go 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. with a scheduled lunch break. Uh, students will also have responsibility for completing asynchronous assignments. Uh, again, there'll be various types of instruction that's utilized throughout the school day to balance the amount of screen time with uh, activities that students need to accomplish. Um, and again, students will be expected to engage in a combination of live sessions and off-screen tasks to ensure their stamina and engagement are at optimum level. At the high school level, the schedule will uh, continue to be a six-day six schedule. Uh, the current schedule allows for a similar rotation, a period-by-period -period rotation, uh, similar to what's seen here. Um, the day would begin at 7.30 and would conclude at 2.30 with a break scheduled in the middle of the day from 10.33 to 11.27 to allow students to access support as well as to take a screen time break and to um, have an opportunity to grab a, a bite to eat. Again, high school students will participate in live stream synchronous instruction daily. There'll be uh, asynchronous assignments assigned as well. Uh, students will engage in a combination of live session and off-screen tasks also. Um, music rehearsals will be scheduled with the teacher during that midday break. Extracurricular activities. So we'll follow the guidance for our athletic department. We'll follow the guidance from the NJSIAA um, as it relates to other activities. Uh, the social activities that take place during the school day, we'll, we'll make sure that we follow the guidance dictated through the Department of Health or New Jersey Department of Education. And student support. So student support, this is obviously uh, uh, a big topic of discussion as well for the Road Forward Committee. Um, the intention is to ensure, ensure that students have access to the assistance and support uh, for clarification, for uh, additional support uh, throughout the duration of any closure. Um, and we're committed to, to, to uh, making available all resources and helping students to uh, be able to continue to access that support. Special education and related services, it's a long statement here, but essentially uh, the crux is, is that the, the district is committed to ensuring that uh, students are met with reasonable accommodations uh, to the best of our ability. Students with 504 plans or with IEPs will ensure that uh, we provide uh, the necessary accommodations and related services for, uh, for those students. And the technology support, any student in need of technology support, um, as has been done in the past, may access uh, this technical assistance simply by submitting an email to student support at chclc.org. And as Dr. Malasha alluded to, um, things have been moving forward. Our, our kids are engaged in activities. Our kids are engaged in social events at the schools. Uh, this is a picture here of the High School East marching band. They took first place at the Tournament of the Bands competition uh, on Sunday at Kingsway High School. So we're, we're extremely proud and happy uh, for the kids from High School East. Uh, the student here, Caitlin Thompson, was also awarded a $500 scholarship uh, for her participation in that, that competition as well. And kudos also goes to the High School West Marching Band. Uh, the, the, the children, High School West Marching Band, um, sort of uh, Renaissance students. They, uh, the band came back together a few years ago after uh, not, not being functional for a number of years. 
And these kids have done a truly phenomenal job. Uh, this young man pictured right here in the front, Jonathan Nadio was awarded a $500 scholarship for his participation. And the band's overall performance throughout this entire season has been outstanding. So we are proud of the kids. We're excited for the kids. We're happy to see that things are moving forward and um, that, things are, that things are going well. So kudos and thank you to everybody that's been involved in all of the Herculean uh, planning that has taken place. Uh, we, we, we will continue to adapt and continue to you know, try to provide the best experience for our kids possible. Are there any questions? Uh, Dr. Morton, uh, Dr. Mayhem, thank you. Uh, just a couple of real basic logistic questions. Sure. So in the meal access for the out of district placement students, and you said that the students would pick up their meals from their schools. What does that mean from their out of district placement or from the school that they would be uh, attending if they were in district? Yeah, it would be the out of district placement school. So, so potentially there could be a situation where we could be required to be closed because of the conditions that exist, but the other school may not be closed. Okay. So, All right, you know, so that's, what, that's what that was alluding to. What happens, heaven forbid, if it's a shutdown in the whole region, what would happen to those out of district placement students? So if Brookfield or Yale or Garfield Park or whatever is also closed, where do those out of district placements get their meals? Yeah, so they would they would pick up lunch, I would imagine, here within within the district, okay. right? Okay. Um, right here. <laughs> just yeah. just want to yeah. clarify. Yes. Second question. So it looks like uh, a full day at all levels. Yes. Um, and some asynchronous. So as you get to the older levels where students are having multiple teachers, yes. how is it being guaranteed that every teacher in a given day isn't doing live instruction thinking, oh, the next one's going to do some asynchronous? So what, what there'll be is a, a combination of live instruction and asynchronous. So what we're thinking is that students will have an opportunity or have a, a requirement to, to sort of like check into the class, receive their instructions for that period, understand what the assignments will require for them to accomplish, they'll go off and have the opportunity to asynchronous, asynchronously uh, complete those assignments, check back in at the end of the period, there'll be a closure to, to the lesson, mm -hmm. and then they'll, they'll move on. I think the teachers are much more well versed and adept to, you know, this, this idea of making a better flow. And then them. the last question has to do with camera, because that wasn't addressed in the presentation. Sure. Um, where are we with the use of cameras um, during instruction? Yeah, so I mean, so, so basically uh, as a district, I think we, you know, we strongly encourage kids, our students to have their cameras on. Uh, and I say, quote unquote, strongly encourage, uh, then they're not mandated to have their cameras on, but we know that uh, there's an art and science to teaching and that, you know, our, our teachers in many respects read the body language of our students and, um, they have a they have a better opportunity to engage with students when cameras are on. So if if students uh, the situation is right and allows it to do so, uh, we suggest that they have their cameras on so that um, the engagement level can be higher. Right. And one one final question. <laughs> so sure, go go for let's, it. <laughs> let's say that certain schools are going to be closed. Um, some are and some are closed. Yes. What is the notification process? to allow families to know that, you know, Woodcrest, Beck, and Payne are closed. Is it a robocall instead of a snow closure? Is Mrs. Wilson going to be doing an all call? Like, uh, just the logistics. So how do parents know if this occurs? Uh, good question, Ms. Friedel. So some of it will be dependent upon the time frame when the notification comes <laughs> to us. Again, as a school district, unless directed, our intention is to remain open, right? To keep the schools open, every day throughout the course of the entire year. Um, so if we are directed, it depends upon what that directive looks like and what that planning will be uh, to go through. But we will use uh, everything within our disposal to make sure that people are aware so that plans can be put into place for the children um, so that they can be appropriately supervised or planned for or taken care of uh, during the course of the day. Um, you know, so yeah, we'll robocalls, emails, you know, the information on the website, the direct things. Uh, but it'll depend upon how that announcement comes, 
um, and from where it arrives. Thank you. And we certainly are all crossing our fingers that that announcement yes. never comes. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Ms. Stern. So thank you, Dr. Morton and Dr. Mahan um, for that the this work and for everybody in the committee is a lot of work. Um, just one follow up question. Um, I know that on the high school level committee, there was discussion about the extracurriculars. Um, and the sports is pretty well lined out because it's it's guided by uh, NJSIAA. Um, there was some discussion about um, other extracurriculars, clubs, other you know um, performing arts, um, musical arts, etc. At, at perhaps having all those extracurriculars be able to follow the same guidelines in terms of if they can be indoors, outdoors, mass on mass, etc. Um, has that been um, clarified about how we're going to proceed with that in the hopefully never happens again case that we would be closed again? Yeah, so so the statement was, so we, we followed the, the guidance of the governing body. So athletics has a governing body in the NJSIAA. Uh, the other activities that you mentioned, there's not necessarily a governing body. So we, you know, those are things that occur within the, the flow of the, the school day, let's say, even if it's at the end of the academic day. So um, a lot of what's able to be, or what would able to be scheduled will be dependent on what we're able, what we're able to do. Um, we may not be able to bring kids back together. So again, we, we followed the guidance of the Department of Health and uh, the NJDOE and you know those to dictate what we're able to do. If we're able to do it, we intend to do it. I think that's that's our position as a district, so. Thank you, so just a quick follow-up. So um, just to clarify, so the Department of Ed would determine whether or not we were, let's say, able to have, um, you know, play performance, a play practice, or um, a chess club meeting, or just you know whatever whatever the activity was. Um, so the Department of Ed would determine whether or no. not we could. Yeah. Do, just so I understand, no, is no, that no? That's, that's not that's not what I meant. So okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, so what I meant is that we we followed their guidance in terms of proximity, in terms of ability to be able to come together. Uh, whether the building's shut down or if the building is open, whether we're able to gather kids together or not, they wouldn't, I don't think they would get into this, this you know, the minutia of, of specific activities, but they would give us overall guidance that we need to follow. And that would, that would dictate what we're able to do. Thank you. I just, I guess, I think looking at some equity in terms of extracurriculars, whether it's athletics or other non-athletic, you know, activities, equitable access for students who participate is really kind of, you know, that's really where the discussion was and in terms of the impact. Again, hopefully we'll never face this again, but um, a lot of our extracurricular activities have really been significantly impacted and are having trouble kind of restarting um, in, in a way that I think maybe may not be as much so with athletics. So how do we, you know, how do we just kind of not get off track with this? So that's really the Trying to find some equity with with those is, is really kind of my thinking. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Morton, Dr. Mahan, and Dr. Malash. Okay. That'll bring us to correspondence. Did any of the board members have correspondence this week? I have some today. Okay, great. Ms. Schultz? So on October 20th at 9 a.m., I attended the Mental Health Task Force Committee, and we had a great uh, meeting for roughly an hour. And we started talking about just the total number of how large this group has grown to. So there's actually 42, the committee is a collaboration of 42 people that make up this, tax, this task force. The first topic was just about QPR, which is question, persuade, and respond. Um, this was actually put into the, the Cherry Hill system uh, back in 2004, and it is to aid with suicide prevention. Uh, our actual police, fire, central administration buildings are all trained in QPR. And what the latest thing that we have done with this is we have now uh, rolled QPR out to our SAC staff as well. And this is basically so that all of our staff and everyone in the buildings are kind of speaking the same language. Um, next, 
we were given just a quick update on the behavioral health screening that was taking place at both of our high schools. And then just as a friendly reminder, this is the opportunity for all of our students at both of our high schools to have a free mental health screening. So that was a nice update. We will be running this again in the spring. So uh, again, encourage everyone to sign up. That is an opportunity that is again at both High School East and West, and it is um, something that is free and we'll be doing that again this spring. We then had an update and uh, spent some time talking about the board goals. One of the things that was in the board goal for this committee was just making sure that we included a representative at every school in regards to mental health. And they were happy to say that we now have a voice in every single building regarding mental health. And then we started to then just kind of focus in on things that we could start to do to expand mental health throughout the district for our parents and some of the things that we had talked about that will start to put into place in the next coming months are just to talk about again um, and provide a presentation to the parents in the next month that just start to talk again and reiterate the resources that are available that are outside of Cherry Hill. Uh, some of the things that were brought up that are going to be included in this presentation are gonna be talking about care solace. Again, we talked about doing this as a Zoom meeting during the evening hours, uh, talking about ESS, high focus, again, um, highlighting the resources that are available to the parents and then also the additional providers that are there as a resource. So uh, look out for this. Uh, this will be going out via, I think, Blackboard. And then this will be, again, a presentation uh, via Zoom during the evening hours. And then we again started to talk again about then some more, uh, again, uh, events or things that we could do. Uh, we then started to talk about having a specific focus uh, at the elementary level. That was an idea that the task force really liked, um, just kind of really starting to focus on um, elementary, uh, transitioning the kids back to in-person learning. How do we support staff? Um, and stress perhaps looking at doing that for an in-service day, um, seeing what we could possibly do with um, Care Solace. Uh, some other suggestions were, um, um, let me see, other suggestions um, were also, uh, what resources could we provide parents for uh, how to navigate um, the various platforms and social media outlets and things that were out there. And then Mrs. Bonnie Mingen had said, you know, if any, members of the task force uh, had resources, certainly send them her way. She was always happy to connect with anybody that might be available. So the next meeting is December 1st and I will be attending that, but then I will we'll also say we will need, a, there's, uh, Ms. Mingen also did put out the schedule for the rest of the year. So I'm happy to attend on December 1st, but they will look to have and need another replacement moving forward after December 1st. It was a great meeting, this committee, they do lots of great work. Um, I'm happy to report out. Any questions? Yes, Ms. Friedel. Um, Ms. Schultz, was there any conversation about how perform care fits into um, the resources and uh, availability to parents? There was not, but I can certainly take that suggestion on Ms. Weathington back to Ms. Mingen. So absolutely, thank you. Yep. I do not see any additional, oh, oh, yes, Ms. Stern. No question or you have correspondence. Okay, we'll take it away. <laughs> was there other was there other correspondence or can Ms. Stern? Oh no, I'm done with my correspondence. Is done? So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, go ahead, Ms. Stern. Well, thank you. So I got just a quick rundown. Um, got a chance to attend the facilities discussions at the Kingston PTA on the 14th. Uh, the East PTA meeting, which was on the 19th, and what was the other one? The 20th. I also, I'm sorry, they're all blurring <laughs> together, although the ideas were not. Um, a third one on, um, I can't remember which one it was. Anyway, it's been, it's been really, really nice and interesting to, and helpful to attend the meetings and just hear the feedback from the community about, you know, in the different buildings, the different needs. Um, and getting a better understanding of uh, you know what the community is is seeing and um, you know where we're moving in a direction in terms of uh, making some decisions about facilities. So it's just great turnout, great uh, input. Um, and then uh, I did get a chance to uh, 
participate in the road forward committee meetings, which has been great. And then today, last but not least, uh, the first day of the New Jersey School Board Association Conference. Uh, and I got a chance to attend the steam tank um, uh, meeting presentation. Um, so this is an initiative with the Department of Education with the, the US Army um, and uh, New Jersey School Board Association. Um, there's a steam tank competition. And the idea is really to focus on um, a uh, practice of uh, focusing on, uh, I think climate is one of the topics, entrepreneurship, and then develop for students to develop projects uh, that they get to then be part of a competition for uh, culminates in a competition. The idea is really to uh, inspire students to have hands on learning, um, be innovative and collaborative and, and the whole steam tank. Um, it's called I2I uh, 365 is really meant to increase uh, steam learning and integrated learning with all different subjects. Um, for kids to brainstorm, create, uh, bring ideas, and it's for actually K through 12. So um, it's a very large and robust um, competition. I think they had 450 student, uh, students participate in, I think it was 2019, and they, they had over 350 last year as well, even during the pandemic, during shutdown. Um, and the, the idea is that students will identify a real world problem and will then come up with some kind of design idea to fix the problem. Uh, they gave the example that some students talked about, but did a project on their, bat, their cell phone batteries running out <laughs> on the bus. And they came up with the idea to use body heat and use uh, to help charge their phones and have heat panels. It's just really interesting and creative. And, I think really um, speaks to the hands-on learning that is most interesting and engaging to students. And sustainability is a big focus of it, um, especially as uh, climate and sustainability is becoming a, a mandated uh, uh, part of our education in New Jersey. So part of why I went to this is I think it's very innovative and it's definitely moving in kind of the direction of shifting how we teach our kids and, and how they learn and also in a fun and interesting, engaging, competitive way. And um, this is something that uh, a lot of our districts in, in the area do participate in. So I think it's something I would ask for, we consider as a board, if this is something we wanna learn more about, if this is something we might wanna consider engaging in, whether or not, um, you know, or, or I guess recommending that we, you know, consider this as an option we can learn more about it and ultimately you know uh, give give this opportunity to uh, to you know as a potential for for our kids to be part of so that was that and then um, I also went to a um, one of the workshops on uh, grants and um, sustainability which is really interesting there's quite a lot of grants out there um, uh, for different types of sustainable energy. Um, there was food composting that some districts are doing. Um, and uh, uh, it's focusing on eliminating, decreasing uh, greenhouse gases and also the, apparently the cost of food waste uh, we, uh, is significant. Um, so some districts have gotten grants to address this in their schools to be able to either donate food or keep use have um, ways to save food, refrigerate food for then after school when for the kids who are in after school programs, after school activities. Um, and they said that um, if each student reduced their food waste by one third um, in, a, uh, in one school, you could save $40,000 in waste handling costs. So in a, a larger district, they gave the example of one district with nine schools they have the potential to save $360,000 in just food waste hauling. So kind of interesting uh, idea to think about. And um, the last workshop I went to was on um, uh, person-centered practice, practices and planning for students with special needs. 
transition project. Um, the the um, person who was presenting was from the Rutgers University Bog Center on Developmental Disabilities. And uh, it was really an interesting to, interesting to, to see. It's kind of a different approach to, uh, to IEP meetings, specifically student-led IEP meetings. Um, uh, there's a lot to learn about it, but you know, essentially that that focusing on on more of a collaborative, almost brainstorming approach is the way it seemed to be presented during the IEP meeting. And they are not only recommending that they're not only doing this with students who are in high school, which is very common that the students are part of the process, but even younger grades. Um, so I just thought that was pretty interesting. And uh, I think that's all I have to report. Any questions, comments? Okay, great, thank you. Ms. Waddell? So I, I just wanna briefly comment that I was able to attend three of the uh, Garrison um, facility conversations with the community. Um, I was at Kingston, Payne and Cherry Hill West. I think that, um, you know, at the high school level, Mr. Garrison was there doing the presentation and then at the elementary level, the principals took the lead. Um, but I found them to be very um, informative. And I think at the West one, um, I think what Mr. Garrison said, and I'm not giving a direct quote, but um, you know, a parent in the in the meeting started talking about the actual life of the school um, and the challenges that students face in the interior of the school, which you know, Mr. Garrison said, this is exactly why we're having these meetings because we can basically we can do an assessment of this is what needs to be fixed structurally um, or or mechanically, but the students live here. So this is the information that we don't have from our, our vision. So I think it's so critical for, for parents, uh, guardians, students to find a way if they can't come to an, a meeting, to email, to do the thought exchange, um, but to really give input as to, you know, what, what does your school need or schools need? So I just wanted to say that, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Friedel. I would also note that I was at several of the meetings with the schools, and I believe the thought exchanges are open now, Dr. Malash, through the 29th? Mm -hmm. uh, through the 29th for the initial ones, and then a little bit longer for the middle school and high school. For the middle school, okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, so again, we encourage the community to please take advantage of that, send us the information, your thoughts, and there's also an email that we have on the web page as well, correct? There is. Uh, if you go on the web page, it's, it's plan at chclc.org. Uh, but yes, and all the presentations that have been delivered so far are available on the website to be able to see. They link directly from the school websites and they're also on the district website. So the presentations that are delivered each of those evenings. There's also another presentation that goes into additional detail uh, about specific work to be uh, that's proposed to be completed at each of the schools. Okay, thank you. Ms. Stern? Just following up on your um, comment about the thought exchange, um, just to clarify, because I know I'm on mailing, some school mailing list and I know we didn't receive the thought exchange, but the meeting already happened. So um, just, and I, is that gonna be, I guess, how are we assuring that those are getting out? How are we assuring that, are they posted on the website? If, yeah, if you let me know what school, I can certainly follow up with the principal. And just in terms of um, is are the thought exchange exchanges where where will families be able to find them if let's say they didn't get the email or they deleted the email or something is there where would they find those for their particular school? So I would tell them to reach directly out to the principal if they don't have the emails. I don't believe the thought exchanges are posted on the websites. Um, you know, especially the elementary schools, they were trying to focus it with what was being sent out to those families uh, to keep it focused on that school to get that perspective. But yeah, they can contact the principal directly. Um, and Dr. Morton and, and Dr. Mann can certainly remind the principals to resend them as well. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Arroyo? I just have some correspondence. Okay. Yes, so I just wanted to share with everybody how amazing Latinos at West um, was this month in celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month. The students at West put together an amazing show and the elementary school students, they loved everything. And we, and I think this year was their first time doing a TikTok challenge. So I'm really excited to see what that looks like. Um, I did not participate. I was in the back. 
Um, but I did get a chance to dance with some of the elementary school students, but definitely a big shout out to Latinos at West for the amazing production they put together. I was so just proud and, the, and how culturally like amazing they put all of our nationalities and it was just absolutely beautiful. So I just wanted to say thank you for that and allowing me to participate. Thank you. Mr. Vadia? Yes, thank you, Mrs. Neary. Um, so I just want to echo um, what Mrs. Arroyo was, was saying. I was able to join only for the, the first um, performance of the day at Carusi, but Latinos at West did an amazing job. And it was, it was wonderful to see, you know, to, to go country by country and different, um, it, was, it was colorful, it was active, it was such a powerful thing to, to not only first, you know, observe and, and really um, learn from, but also then be a part of. Now, I understand from TikTok, you can monetize these things, and I am part of that video. So my hope is that the royalty check really becomes a nice bonus uh, of this volunteer His dance. dancing skills aren't that great, guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, I, I was able, um, like some of my fellow board members, to be at the East uh, Facility Improvement Plan meeting on the 19th. Um, I think I was, uh, I was representing at, at Cooper the next day, and I'm looking forward to being at Beck tomorrow. Um, it's, in, it's an interesting experience, I would say. So there's, there's what happens in the front of the house, right? In front of the house, um, Garrison does a nice job. The principals are doing a very nice job about, about sharing plans with the community and soliciting input. Um, but I guess I, I would say that I've had probably more fun and, and more engagement on the back of the house. You know, you talk to people one-on-one -on -one and it's interesting, you know, one of the things about being in an environment like this with, uh, you know, this big gulf and, uh, you know, we walk in separately from the public. You don't get that as much. It, it has been nice, you know, at, at Cooper and at East and um, where I was before that, Bret Hart. You know, you're able to really chat with people and, you know, hear what their concerns are on an individual level. A lot of times people don't want to speak up. You know, they don't think necessarily they have a, the, the, full, the full idea of, of what's going on. But um, so it has been nice to connect. And I have to say they've been excellent. I think the questions from the community have been great. Um, you know, Mr. Garrison, does a, does a cool job, but you know, I, I think there's a lot of local genius in our principals at the elementary level. Tomorrow will be the first middle school level, so I'll let you know how it goes, but that's been good. And then of course, um, NJSBA opened today. I, I watched the opening keynote, um, which was interesting. Um, what was cool about the way they opened it up a year ago is that it was Cherry Hill West students in a virtual Brady Bunch um, on steroids were kind of like performing and that was amazing to have on a, on a statewide stage. It wasn't as cool as that this year, but it was, it was plenty cool. And uh, what's good about these things is that they'll be available for 30 days. So I don't know how much I'm gonna do in real time, but I, I am looking forward to quite a few of the presentations. And uh, that's all I have to share for correspondence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Avadia. Were there any others? Okay. That'll bring us then to our student representative to the board's presentation. And we'll start this evening with High School East. Uh, hi, everybody. Good evening. Um, so for upcoming events, we're currently in our Red Ribbon Week. Uh, Friday was Jersey Day. Yesterday was my favorite pajama day. Um, today was blackout day, blackout vaping, and tomorrow is um, take a chill day with neon day. Um, all of these are for combating harmful substance and violence in our district. Um, in a few weeks will be our spirit week where we hope to do all of our traditional activities after school and during school and our dances. Um, on that note, Hokaween, um, which was held jointly by Thespian Society and SGA, was a huge success. Over 900 students came and you know stayed for a long time. Um, this is record attendance and we hope to see that through the next years. Um, next week on November 2nd, the East Gemidar School will be used to, or like will become a voting site. Um, and it will be done at the East Gym so that wing will be blocked off and school will just run smoothly um, around that, which is great. Um, as for sports, sports are running really smoothly. 
Um, I'm pretty sure today the girls volleyball team won 2-0 against Lenape. Um, but as uh, you know, the fall starts closing down, fall sports starts winding down. Um, and tomorrow there'll be a breakfast at East for East and West um, fall senior athletes. Um, so an update on Lunch and Learn. Lunch and Learn has been a huge success. It's been going on for a few weeks now. Um, the switch has been incredibly smooth. Basically all students are following, you know, eat at the cafeteria. And then when you're done eating, you go out and you do whatever you want. It's given an opportunity for students to get extra help during lunch and not have to stay after. And it has also opened up um, the back field and both gyms where people, you know, uh, sit with their friends and play a lot of sports, which gives them more um, activity and stuff like that. Um, and also the hour just in the middle of the day is really healthy for all of us just to have a break from classes and a break from instruction and just being able to wind down, um, which is great and we're really grateful for it. Um, finally, we wanna give a shout out to the facilities department for doing such a good job in beautifying the East main entrance. It's really pretty and we're really thankful for that. Um, so that's all, thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have the High School West report. Hello, this is Kevin Salvatrelli. I'm the student rep from West. Um, in school news, this week is our spirit week. Um, and last night we held our annual lip sync competition, which will, and going on right now down the road at the stadium is uh, NHS's annual fundraiser dodgeball tournament. Um, tomorrow is our homecoming dance, Thursday is movie night, and Friday we will wrap up spirit week with a pep rally. Um, in activities news, mostly relating to Spirit Week, uh, the lip sync competition took place last night. Um, and I'd like to say congratulations to our sophomore class as they were the winners. Um, I think they put on a really good performance, although I may be a little biased towards my senior class. I think it was a very uh, close decision on that. Um, and also, despite us losing power in the middle of the performance, which was quite interesting for me sitting back at the tech booth, um, our wonderful student performers and spectators uh, kept the show running even in the darkness. Uh, and an act of school unity, uh, student staff, uh, community members, and anyone who was here held up their phones from the audience to help light up the stage while we were waiting for the power to come back. Um, Tomorrow is homecoming and tickets for, are for, on sale in the cafeteria each day. I believe they will also be allowing um, people to buy tickets at the door. And I would hope to see all students there. Um, and this will be the first time it's been held outdoors. Um, and that will, be able, uh, that will be to help people ensure distancing um, and make it safer for students to eat and, and ha have a good time outside, even with COVID going on. Um, we are also holding our pep rally on Friday, which uh, will be the first time in basically two years that we've been able to get the entire school together in one area um, and really just congratulate our, uh, my, our, our community on really being back at school um, and going through the school year. Uh, this will be also held outside at the stadium, uh, which is also a first for us. Um, there's also the Hispanic Heritage Tours, and I know some board members have already spoke about this, but I would like to reiterate how amazing it was to see everybody perform. I was, uh, me and the co or the alternate board rep, Sam Messias, were the tech crew for the event, and we had the uh, fun of loading tons of equipment from this building into my car and driving it around from school to school. Um, but I, I, I would like to say it was a huge success, and the VODs of those performances are available on the West YouTube channel, if anyone would like to go back and take a look. Um, and at Kilmer, we were actually able to hold a performance out in front of the school, and some people met, stopped to take a look from Chapel Ave. Um, in department news, the vocal music program is well on their way towards their winter concert, uh, and the acapella groups uh, were able to perform at Spirit Week's lip sync last night. Uh, and it ended off with a rendition of our alma mater, which again, this is one of the first times we've been able to perform it as a large group with the school together. It has been very meaningful to all of the students. Um, the theater department has cast uh, the Rodgers and Hammerstein uh, version of Cinderella the musical, and the show will open in January and run for three days. This will be the first full theatrical perfor performance since the start of the pandemic, and we hope to see all of uh, our entire community there. 
um, instrumental music and marching band. Uh, marching band capped off a great season with, uh, in their first year in tournament of the bands. They placed third in their division uh, with the second place group just barely ahead. In the other four competitions this year, the band captured three second place trophies and one first place. We'd also like to congratulate senior John Nadio for receiving a $500 uh, scholarship from the championship, uh, from, or from the tournament of the bands. Um, in athletics, the East-West football game will be coming up, um, and East and West students are all looking forward to a, to a continuation of the tradition of our cross-town rivalry and partnership in the East-West game. Um, but again, biased as I may be, I hope to see the boots stay here at West. Um, in our final thing, our student comments, uh, we'd like to comment on the substitute shortage. Uh, we'd like to reiterate how important substitute teachers are in maintaining a smooth education experience for all students. And I'd like to encourage all community members who are able to become substitute teachers and help fill, uh, fill substitute positions and, have, and make our schools operate as smooth as possible. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, that brings us now to our first public comment. Oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Just making sure. Okay, so that brings us to our first public comment. It is for action items only, items 13 through 16. As always, please remember to state your full name, municipality only, please, and the item at which you are speaking and acting as a civil model of decorum, Cherry Hill Community Values Education, issues that affect our children, schools, and community bring out strong emotions in all of us. The board takes seriously its vision to work with civility. Please join the board in sending a message to our students that even the most difficult issues can be addressed while showing respect for one another. And again, please state your full name, municipality only, and the agenda item you'll be speaking to. I don't see any comments in person or on the line. So I will turn it over to you, Dr. Mosh, for superintendent comments. Thank you, Mrs. Neary. Uh, I wanna thank the student board reps for their comments again this evening. Uh, it's always great for us to get a perspective through their eyes about the experiences and what's taking place, what they highlight uh, and what they share about what's going on. Uh, so I'm always thankful for the students for being here and for reporting out. As I said at the beginning of the meeting, we are at the end of October. This is our, our last meeting uh, in October. So we're almost two full months uh, into the academic year. The year, as always, seems to be going relatively quickly. Uh, it's been a year of reintroducing our students and our staff and our community members back to a, a new normal of operation of the school days. There's been a lot of time and energy spent on transition and trying to provide support for the folks who are here. Um, spe some special thank yous uh, to people in the district first. Um, to our school nurses. Uh, our school nurses, their jobs have changed dramatically since September of 2019. Uh, I'm incredibly appreciative to the work that the nurses throughout the district have been doing, the role that they play answering questions um, to deal with, with COVID positive or COVID exposure, uh, speaking with the community, doing contact tracing, uh, maintaining contact with uh, the Camden County Department of Health. Uh, I just am incredibly appreciative to what the nurses do for our students, for our staff, and for our family members here in Cherry Hill. Uh, so please make sure you thank the nurses when you get a chance to see them, uh, or if you're in contact with them, thank them for all that they are doing. Uh, it was great to hear the shout out to the facilities department. Again, another one of the unsung heroes uh, that are in our district are members of the facilities department. If you have not had the opportunity to see the new landscaping that's in front of High School East, it really does look fantastic. Um, the gentlemen, from that crew did a wonderful job. Um, grateful for the input and for the, the involvement uh, of the staff and students at High School East that helped to design what was gonna take place. This Friday night is the annual homecoming uh, football game. Uh, the East-West game is taking place at the stadium, at the Mo uh, Jonas Simara Stadium, beginning at 6 p.m. Dr. Morton, does that sound right, 6 p.m.? At 6 p.m. on Friday evening, uh, all are invited to come out. Uh, we always look forward to seeing alumni and family members and community members. Um, and as Kevin mentioned, they do play for the, for the boot, um, the Aldebart Trophy, uh, which is an old football boot uh, that's painted and, and is on the top of it. It, it goes back uh, decades and decades. Um, so we're looking forward to people coming out 
uh, to the game. It's always good to catch up with folks while they are there. Um, we are still having some challenges uh, as we're going through the year. Transportation uh, continues to be a challenge on a daily basis. Uh, and a lot of that often uh, focuses on the availability of bus drivers. And then it is also compounded by uh, just the impact on traffic uh, and work that's being done throughout the community. We appreciate, appreciate the patience um, that people have been granting to the bus drivers uh, and to the bus companies uh, in terms of transportation. We understand the frustration uh, thank you to the folks in our transportation department who field the calls, who share information and serve as a liaison between the school district and families and the different busing contractors. Um, bus com companies are all hiring. Uh, if anybody is looking for a job, I encourage you to take a look at being a bus driver, being a substitute teacher. Uh, we are hiring for educational assistance for cleaners. Uh, our Aramark uh, group is still hiring for uh, folks to work in the cafeteria and in the kitchens. There are lots of jobs that are available. Um, we always love having people from the community that are involved in working within the school district. If you are interested, look under the employment tab on our website or email one of us. We'd be more than happy to point you in the right direction um, for what's going on. Thank you to the Road Forward Committee that Dr. Morton talked about and Dr. Mahan talked about and the work that they've been doing uh, on the transition back to school, the different level committees that they broke into over the course of the last few weeks uh, to prepare and, and go through materials. There has been, as, as Ms. Stern has reported out, um, robust discussion and great involvement uh, in detail with questions and dialogue that has gone on. So I'm thankful to those people that have dedicated and volunteered their time to be a part of those committees. Um, High School East is the only one of our facilities that's being used on election day this year, which is next Tuesday, November the 2nd. Um, the election, the voting will take place in the East Gym, which is at the back of the building. There will be signs about parking and where to go. There will not be any contact between students uh, and folks from the community who are coming in to vote. Um, we've done a walkthrough already with the Board of Elections from Camden County uh, to go through the site, talk about parking uh, and everything that, that's involved with the voting that day. Uh, so again, um, a special thank you to everybody that's involved in that process. I agree the the Latinos at West production uh, it was the 10th year of the annual tour. Um, thank you to Senor, Senor Rivas Mintz, Dr. Batista and Ms. Giles, uh, who accompanied the students. Uh, Senora Rivas Mintz is the one who has continued to develop this program, uh, who has run it each of the 10 years that it's taken place. Just a wonderful experience uh, and a great show. Um, it was certainly was highlighted this year and, and made possible for more students to be able to see it um, by what Kevin talked about, he and Sam being there to be able to broadcast uh, in the classroom. So continuing to adapt and to adjust uh, based on the circumstances and, and with what we are faced. For the board members and for the community members. Now for the board members, I left at each of your spots two books. These are the One Book, One Cherry Hill books this year that are sponsored by the Cherry Hill Library. Um, we had ordered them quite some time ago. Unfortunately, with everything else, it was delayed. Uh, but I do have the books for each of you. Uh, the Vanishing Half is the adult book. Uh, and Genesis Begins Again uh, was the teen book. There are still some activities going on at the library that are associated with uh, the One Book, One Cherry Hill. You can go on the library's website that's for the board members or for anybody in the community to be involved, um, but some great reads. Uh, congratulations to Laverne Mann, who's the library director and her team uh, for the work that they continue to do and for engaging and involving the community. And I go, oh, last week, uh, High School East and Kilmer Elementary School both, rece both received their formal awards as National Schools of Character at the character.org annual national convention. It was done virtually again this year. Uh, special congratulations to Dr. Perry and, and his team at East and to Dr. Rickensrud and his team at Kilmer. Um, and, and as we talked about last spring uh, in Cherry Hill Nine, now all 19 of our schools have been uh, identified as national schools of character and we've been identified as a district, as a national district of character. As we've continued to transition into the school year, we, we continue to deal with some challenges um, that are associated with everybody being back together. Um, students and staff and adults um, not just in, in the school community, but the community at large, uh, at times are challenged with um, how do we interact? How do we disagree? Uh, what does that look like? Um, we expect at times students to be involved in certain activities when you have children of a certain age, developmentally, at times there are conflicts that exist. Um, we continue to ask parents and families and the students themselves uh, to try to avoid conflict. And when conflict does happen, to go to the adults or somebody that's there to try to assist them with it if they are unable to do it on their own. Uh, one of the challenges that continues to exacerbate conflict, again, with children and with adults that we are seeing in our community uh, is social media. 
um, for parents of our students, Instagram Live and things like that um, are absolutely being used uh, by students on a regular basis. Please make sure you are aware uh, of what your child is involved in, uh, what they are broadcasting, what they are putting out there. Um, again, please have those conversations at home. We're having them at school. We'll continue to have them in school. Um, and to the adults in the community, same thing. You know, please be aware of what you're putting out there um, and, and how you are addressing and dealing with conflict. Then the fine th final thing, Mrs. Neary, is that we have tentative dates scheduled in November um, back for vaccination clinics. Um, we are anticipating in the near future, um, you know, that students, children ages five through 11 uh, will be able to receive the vaccination. Uh, so we have already worked with Adler's Pharmacy, who has done vaccination clinics back in the spring and in the summer to schedule tentative dates. Um, we will publish those as, as soon as the clearance for the vaccination is provided. We are also working on Camden County Department of Health to try and schedule a larger scale on a weekend uh, clinic in at least one of our schools uh, as well. As soon as that information is available, we will send that out directly to all families. Um, we will push it out you know, as a direct communication through Blackboard. We'll post on our websites and the school websites and we'll highlight those dates um, to try to provide that service to families uh, as quickly as we can. Great, thank you, Dr. Malash. Okay, that brings us then to our action agenda. The superintendent recommends, and I move the following, item 12.1, action to consent, approve items 13 through 16. Do I have a second? Ms. Seidel? Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, Mr. Sugar. Okay, board members, your online voting is open. And if you have any abstentions, you can indicate them now. Ms. Sugars, I need to abstain from 14.1 and 16.1, please. Mrs. Sugars, I need to abstain from 14.1 as well. Ms. Sugars, yes. I too need to abstain from 14.1. I was out of time. Mrs. Sugars, I need to abstain from Henry Shine on the bill list, please. Ms. Sugars, I need to abstain from interactive kids on the bill list. Uh, Ms. Sugar, I need to abstain from 14.1. Thank you. Ms. Sugars, I have to abstain from interactive kids on the bill list. Mrs. Mary, I have a question about one of the policies. Okay. Because we had said we would discuss one of the policies under, under second reading, we wanted to just re just readdress it. Which I remember, are you looking at? You know, I, I, my screen is blocked, Mrs. Sugar, if I'm gonna, um, I'm trying, I can't get to my screen because my, the voting is here. I can't, I can't, Pull up the policy. Are you referring to the policy on the board's remote attendance? No, the the um, balance lunch balance policy. Okay, so if there's any that's to come back at the next committee okay. of the whole. Okay, so that's that not up for vote. Okay, just clarifying. Thank you. Okay, no problem. So you have my 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 one abstention. Then. Thank you. Okay, other than the abstentions noted, it's a unanimous yes vote. This is near, I just want to highlight one of the things that the board just approved in acceptance of donations under the BNF section. Um, there was a monetary donation that was made this evening by the East Musicians on Call Club. And I believe a number of the members are here. Um, Chris, let's see who else is here. Chris, Brooke, Rebecca, Ved, Maddie, Eva, Shivani. Are you guys all here? Can we take a walk down to this microphone? At least one, or Chris, at least you. Bring all the kids down uh, as long as they're all comfortable doing that. Um, and their advisor, Mr. Mancinelli, I believe is online. Hey, Mr. Mancinelli, thank you for joining us this evening as well. 
I just wanted to introduce you to members of the East Musicians on Call, uh, which was a new group that was formed um, of their own determination and decisions um, during the course of the pandemic. Uh, I asked Chris if he would say a few words just about what they did, what they're doing, and why they chose to do this. So, um, so Chris. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Christian, and I am a current junior at Chero High School East. And together with our board members, we founded Ch uh, Chero East's East Musicians on Call, uh, more commonly known as EMC. And we're a community and service driven music club at East. And we founded last year to help benefit our community, not only during the COVID pandemic, but further on with senior center performances and et cetera. So some stuff we've been doing as a club is we've been going around senior centers and we've been performing uh, music, uh, music performances and mini concerts. What we did last year is we provided a total of seven 30 minute virtual projects for different senior centers and hospitals. And we sent them out to different centers and uh, we had a great reply and a great response from them. And we are continuing to do this uh, now moving both in person and somewhat virtual format as well. And we are looking forward to move forward more with this this school year. And another big aspect of our club has been local community music improvement. Uh, so this is actually part of our larger project, which is we call Project Crescendo, helping kids make music. Uh, we started this last year, and basically the overall goal is to help lower the entry barrier for elementary school kids to start their musical performances and start their musical lives. Uh, at, uh, most students in Cherry Hill do have a good financial situation to begin their musical careers, rent an instrument and et cetera. But we hope that with our fundraising and different events and different tutoring sessions we do, we're able to help lower this barrier and provide more opportunities for kids to have more access to music. So as I just listed, uh, uh, the monetary donation, is our fundraising from last year, a total of $3,074, which we did with a collaboration of a very successful GoFundMe program uh, with a lot of sponsors from both our school, teachers, outside community members, and et cetera. And we also held a big benefit concert and et cetera, et cetera, and a lot of other fundraising donations that we got. And we're very thankful to everyone in our community members. And thank you to the Board of Education for recognizing this today. And also we've been doing uh, elementary school music tutoring programs, which we started last year virtual format. And we're also moving forward this year in an in-person and virtual mixed form. And we plan on accessing into middle schools, elementary schools, and providing free community service-based music tutoring to help kids get more influence and a better access to music tutoring and the whole musical aspects of their lives. So uh, in summary, we just wanna say in the future, we continue to aim to add to our contribution that we're giving today. And we hope that our influence in the music, in the music departments of Cheryl Public Schools can be accentuated and that we hope to make an influence and a difference in these kids' lives in the future. Thank you. I just wanted to give a quick shout out the names of our board members uh, because they're all here today. We have Rebecca Sabbath, Eva Shim, Abriella Camp, Brooke Warren, uh, Shivani Haradashandran, and those who couldn't make it today were Maddie Reddy, uh, Vet Chidrawar, and Grace Pierlot. So just wanted to say those names and thank you everyone for recognizing us today and accepting our donation. And we hope to come back soon again with more. Thank you. Chris and your board, thank you so much for what you've done. Uh, I remember when you emailed last year and you were first putting it together. Uh, it's incredible what you all were able to create thus far and what you're establishing right now just during your time, um, you know, as, as uh, your time here at, at East and in Cherry Hill. We're grateful for what you're doing. We hope to have you back and, and see more uh, and to see it continue to expand. So thank you all, uh, great inspiration. Thank you, Dr. Mosh. Thank you so much. Okay, that brings us now to new business. Did any of the board members have new business this evening? Mr. Avadi? 
I think piggybacking on something that I think was in correspondence, I guess, when we'll, so we've got, we've got thereabouts 10 bond presentations out there. Um, let's say 300, 350 people in the room, maybe some online. And we've got thought exchanges out in 10 communities. At what point, I'm just asking for administration, I mean, not tonight, obviously, but when will we start to see some early uh, sensing in terms of what the results are, what the common themes are, so we can, you know, I mean, we're, we're in the business of learning. How do we learn from this so that the next 10 are better? That's a good question, Mr. Vadia. So uh, actually, Mrs. Sugars and I spent some time yesterday afternoon and Mrs. Sugars again today going through uh, a timeline of, of information share and what it looks like between now um, and just after the first of the year uh, with the board. I expect that we'll start to get some of the analysis from the thought exchange uh, beginning a week from Friday, or I'm sorry, so it'll actually, it will, we won't have it, won't be ready for the third of, um, of November. It'll be ready for the week of the 8th of November uh, because the initial thought exchanges don't close until the 29th. Um, so Mrs. Wilson is working with the folks uh, in Canada from thought exchange um, to do individual analysis by building and then do the overall themes uh, based on what's found. So as, we, as soon as we have that, I expect the week of the 8th, we'll start to share that out, um, which ideally we can have some initial discussion at the board meeting on the 9th. Um, you know, and then go through, like I said, we have a, uh, a calendar, proposed calendar of discussions that, you know, have our board meetings that have the uh, community forums, uh, community town halls that are scheduled, the one in November on the 22nd, the one in December on the 15th, um, you know, included in that, those uh, talking time frame. Thank you, Dr. Moss. Did you have anything else, Mr. Abadi? No, I, I guess my only thought is, um, so if they're closing the 29th, my only thought is maybe we could do um, like a very back of the envelope analysis to see based on community sizes where we may be light. Now they say with email communications, I think you have to get it out three to five times before people see something. And I think that that can be a challenge, you know, for me, I mean, you know, I get more letters than I'd like to my kids' school, you know, but um, I think that can be a challenge. So I just encourage us to, you know, if, they, if we do have particularly like community, it's just such a great opportunity um, and it's, we're pretty compressed. So I just think it may be a good idea, but yeah, no, that's great to hear. And I look forward to, to seeing that. Yeah, so we'll definitely have the principles again for the ones that are already out there will be closing this week, but that again tomorrow um, to send those reminders to go back through, um, you know, and again, in, in those instances, um, if we can package it so that it's coming from the school, we have found that there's been better response when it comes directly from the school about it. So yes, we'll get that out again. Okay, great, thank you. Was there anybody else? Okay, that'll bring us to old business. Did anyone have anything under old business? Ms. Bardell? Um, Dr. Malosh, is there any information about the start times? I, I, there was a, an email a survey that had gone out. Um, is it still data collection or? Uh, good question, Ms. Friedel. Yes, there were uh, surveys that went out to the different uh, sections of the community. Dr. Morton and uh, the district-wide committee, so folks representing High School East and High School West and the Alternative High School met last Friday for the day. Um, I believe they're still going through the information they have, um, probably early November, I think, Dr. Morton, right? November 9th, we're expecting uh, November 9th at the board meeting. Um, so we'll share it out with the, some information with the board beginning of next week, or like the, the first. Uh, we'll share out some initial information uh, and then a presentation on the 9th. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Morton. Thank you. Is there anything else under old business? All right. Um, I just wanted to, I know there was conversations about the school lunches at some of the meetings. Has there been any updates on um, if there's going to be like a review or just further discussion or how we're approaching that? Yeah, so there's absolutely ongoing discussion about um, the meals, you know, what's going on with breakfast uh, and with lunch, um, both with what's being served and the numbers uh, that are involved with the meal service as uh, Mrs. Wilson and I have gone around and, and started our uh, town hall meetings with the students, uh, it's a regular topic of discussion 
uh, with the students as well. Um, we expect again with uh, October ending this week, um, we'll go through and present to the board in November those initial numbers, the initial information um, from September and from October, give a baseline for where we are. Uh, again, a lot of it has been norm setting for the folks at Aramark. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to compare the experience with what's being prepared. Uh, going back to the, you know, the, the last uh, September, which was September of 2019, uh, because of the availability of the meals. Um, on average, I believe it's a little more than three times the number of meals that were being served uh, at that time are being served now. Um, and we are nowhere near the same number of staff. Um, there's a dramatic about a two dozen, I think, Mr. Sugars, um, staff deficiency right now um, with our mark. Um, you know, so it has added to some of their challenges. But yes, we'll have some initial information for what September and October look like, but the numbers, the meals, um, there's a lot of information that is on the website. Um, they started to expand the, the menu options. Um, there are still some limits on the menu options that are purely driven by um, the challenges, which is not having enough staff. Thank you, Dr. Malash. Were there any other comments, concerns under old business? Okay. Since there are none, that will bring us to our second public comment. And there'll be three minutes for public comment. We have one hour for this evening's pu second public comment, and we do have items for our second executive discussion. So for second public comment, Please, as always, state your full name and your municipality only. And we'll start with in-person and then on the line, and we'll alternate as usual. Hi, everyone. Um, Jen Fleischer, Cherry Hill. Um, I just wanted to first thank the board for, I went to the East um, Bond presentation and I thought, that Garrison, the board members, administration, everyone did a wonderful job. So thank you very much for having all of these. And I am looking forward to seeing what um, Mr. Avadia said about the next steps and how we're going to actually sort of water down everything that we've seen. Because I think all these people going to these bond presentations want every single thing that we've seen because we all know how much work has to be done. So um, I appreciate the consistent conversations. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay, next we'll go to the line and we have a number on the line. So please state your full name and municipality. Hi, this is Jeff Otterwitz, um, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. This is from an article um, written by uh, we can't Bob. Hear you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, this is from an article by Bob Herpin, uh, September 27, 2018, Sherry Hill reason, Sun. We can't hear you on the line. You're not muted, but we can't hear you. Could you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes or no? Hello? Maybe you can dial back in from another number. Okay, next we'll go to the audience. Uh, Plena Mint, Cherry Hill, thank you very much for having me. Uh, a few concerns that I have to share with you. Uh, first of all, regarding masks and uh, mask mandates and filtration capabilities. There is no research that supports mask mandates. Um, unless a mask is an ASTM level three mask, it is not stopping coronavirus from spreading one bit. Most children are wearing level one mask like this one, uh, which only collects bacteria and spread illnesses. Uh, faster because children touch them all day. I call on this board to suspend all mask mandates. Uh, next is regarding FDA recommendation uh, for vaccination of five-year-olds and above. Uh, there is no scientific or medical marriage for that FDA recommendation. I call on the board to issue a warning to parents about risks that are associated from such vaccination that should be considered by each and every parent and of course school administrators before they offer that those types of vaccines experiment, experimental vaccines uh, for children. 
Uh, next, um, concerns regarding sexualization of children. Uh, there is a new uh, comprehensive sexual education that is going to be implemented as of next year by uh, recommended uh, by New Jersey, New Jersey Department of Education guidelines, uh, which uh, is um, highly inappropriate for children. I call on this board to decline adoption of the Department of Education new CSE curricula. Uh, next, uh, consideration of goal, um, board goal regarding anti-racism. Um, there is active discrimination under the guise of equity. According to Abraham Kendi, equity means an authorized anti-racist discrimination. Uh, instead of equality, um, Kendi favors equity, a system under which jobs and opportunities are appropriate, uh, appropriate among different groups in shares mirroring their representation in larger society. In his book, Candy is clear about how this must be achieved. The only, and I'm quoting Candy now, the only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination, end of quote. I call on this board to remove the anti-racist goal. And lastly, regarding concerns of anti-Semitism and in Ibram Kendi's anti-racist adoption. According to an article by Daniel Friedman on October 25th, 2020, the name of the article is Anti-Racism, Anti-Semitism, and the False Problem of Jewish Success. I'm thank gonna you. Thank you. Okay, next we'll go to the line to Laura. Please state your full name and municipality. Hi, my name is Laura Pendergast and I live in Cherry Hill. Um, and I am just calling to ask you to please keep and continue, keep your goal of anti racism. I'm able to hear you. Um, I am just calling to ask you to please keep your goal We're of anti racism. If you want to hold on the line, I'll take the comments in the audience. Sure. Next, we'll go to the audience. Alana Yaris, Terry Hill. Um, I want to thank the district for being proactive in uh, scheduling potential dates for vaccine clinics for children ages five to 11 for parents to choose to vaccinate their children if they wish. Um, I'm glad that's an opportunity available for all in the district who choose to do it, not mandated. And second, I spoke at town council last night and I just wanted to reiterate here Town Council uh, or the township has a NICSL service that they're supposed to utilize to alert the township of any road closures or flooding or anything else going on in town. And they haven't been using that service and it does affect the students and parents in the district. So I would ask that the board please pressure the township to use that service so that the accident that happened yesterday morning by East High School is alerted to people so that they're not stuck in traffic the way I was. Um, there was a power outage last night at West because of a down power line that as I was speaking at my public comment, the police posted on Facebook where people aren't necessarily on social media or looking to further prove my point that Nixle should have been utilized so that people know there's a road closer. So again, I just ask that you please pressure the township to utilize the services that they have so that the district is made aware and the township and community is made aware as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we'll go to the audience. Rick Short, Cherry Hill. Uh, first up comment on the current bond. Currently, you have an Achilles heel to the bond in all 19 schools with ventilation. You are continuing to ignore the Achilles heel. And like any Achilles heel, once it breaks, the bond will not pass. Also, I can't count how many times our cultural, uh, cultural consultant, Dr. Greeson, has called different times for white supremacy. In yesterday's tweet, 
he endorsed white supremacy, calling, referring to white people as, as white supremacists. And you hear this regularly from Dr. D'Angelo calling whites racist. Let me give you the definition of racism. And then also let me give you the definition of white privilege because white privilege is being taught in our curriculum. This is from the Oxford Dictionary. Racism is the belief, and I'm gonna add one word. I'm gonna add white to it. I'm gonna replace the word human to white. And I'm gonna read both at the same time. Racism is the belief that groups of white people pose different behavioral traits corresponding to inherent attributes and can be divided based on superior one race over another race. Now I'm gonna read the exact quote from the Oxford Dictionary of white privilege. Let's see. Inherent advantage posed by a white person on the basis of their race in a society characterized by racial inequity and injustice. Anytime anyone says white privilege, you are saying a racist statement and you, the board, is allowing this to occur. There is no such thing. It is inherently bad to say white privilege because it's racist. I cannot believe that we are teaching our students about white privilege in school when Dr. Greeson, who calls us white people, white supremacists. It is unbelievable what is happening in this school district with their African-American quote unquote studies. Thank you. Were there any other comments in the audience? Ann Einhorn, 1017 Edgemore Road, Cherry Hill. It gives me no great pleasure to read these comments to any of you this evening. I speak to this board tonight regarding the decision to have second public comment reduced to one hour. What happened between this past Sunday night when I read the agenda to today when I reread the, when I reread the agenda? When did this board discuss this change for public comment? I know that the president and vice president set the agenda, but when was it discussed by the board? This change, gives, this change gives the impression that our board has totally moved away from transparency, accountability, and communication from we, the public, that voted you into office, especially those board members that ran on a platform of transparency and accountability. It gives the impression this board has something to hide or just doesn't care what this community thinks. Limiting public comment is suspect. Why would you put yourselves in this position when you're asking this very public to attend tours of our school buildings and community meetings and what and that you want to hear from us? Who wants to come if there is not enough time to speak? Public speaking from the community may not always be pleasant, but it may give food for thought from other members of the community. Given that there are no more public committee meetings for November and December, where the public gets its own first chance to hear anything to be commented on. And there was very little discussion by board members present at the last committee of the whole. When is the discussion being done? I'm just absolutely bewildered at this decision. You will not gain public trust if all cannot participate in a public forum. This as we try to move forward with a bond. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Seinhorn. Howard Yaris, Cherry Hill. I'm gonna say something that's very controversial right now, which is nothing unusual for public comment. I was involved in board activities when student representatives were on the board and they sat with the board. They took part in board activities, part of a discussion. What I heard tonight was very good news about both high schools, but I did not see these students sitting with you or taking part in the discussion. That's what the students fought for, not to be cheerleaders. Maybe they're involved with your committee meetings. I don't know that, 
but it's a public perception. I'm not seeing that. Next issue is gonna be very, very controversial. I'm not certain how I feel about this thing, but I'm reaching a point, I'm gonna ask you to end the second public comment. If people wanna go ahead and talk to a larger audience, there's people on Zoom, they can do that on social media. They can do it in other places. I am tired of hearing mistruths and lies about scientific fact being presented in front of this board. There's no opportunity for anyone to go ahead and object to that. And there's a number of scientific studies where if you say something often and long enough and loud enough, people start believing it. I am concerned that the issue of public comment is being misused and not being directed to board issues, the things that affect our children, but to handle other agendas. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We'll go to the line now. Hopefully we'll be able to hear. Um, we have Kim Gallagher. Hi, Kim Gallagher. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Are, are you speaking, Ms. Gallagher? I am, yes. Can you hear me? We still can't seem to hear. Hello? We can hear you only only through the Zoom, Mrs. Gallagher. We can't hear you in the auditorium. Okay, so should I keep talking or? I think I can turn my mic. Can we reset her time to three minutes? Hold on a moment, on. Mrs. Gallagher. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Gallagher. All right, um, uh, Kimberly Gallagher, Terry Hill. Um, you want a bond and you ask for community input and yet you limit public comment to one hour. Your lack of regard for the community and its voices are the reasons the bond will probably fail. Secondly, the discussion of emergency closure plans timing is frightening. I understand why the district needs this plan, but why hasn't why wasn't it needed prior to school starting? As the holidays and an election approaches, I fear that this plan will go into place once Thanksgiving comes. I hope you are advocating for our district and community telling the state that our schools are doing well and do not need to close. Last year, you did what was best for the teachers unions. This year, please do what is best for the students. They do not need any more disruptions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gallagher. Okay, next on the line, we have a telephone number. If you can please state your full name and municipality. Can you hear, can you hear me? Uh, my name is Jeff Potowitz. I live in Cherry Hill. This is from an article um, dated uh, September 27th in the Cherry Hill Sun entitled Chapter Voices Opposition to District's New Sipog. New Jersey code requires each school district to have a special education advisory group in place to provide input on issues concerning students with disabilities. In addition, Chapter and district officials both confirm that Cherry Hill Public Schools has identified Cherry Hill edu Special Education PTA as the group, as that group. And I'm skipping. At a school board meeting, a number of speakers requested that the board examine the issues and stand up for the parents who were in attendance. Quote, you are here to represent the community, the parents, and the children. Resident Miriam Stearns said to the board, please represent the special ed community. Please challenge what is being told to the special ed community, that all of a sudden, after the special ed community actually challenged the administration, they are being rendered completely powerless. Anyone listening, please read this other article, and also please, please read the other article um, from November 5th entitled, Cherry Hill School District Found to be in Violation of State Sapog Requirements, um, again by Bob Harpin, and it was found in the Cherry Hill Sun. Just read the two articles, and I think if you read the two articles, you can you can 
I think I think it tells you something, and you could you could learn something, even though that was three years ago. About what other people are saying, yeah, you, yeah, I, I don't know why that limit of an hour was uh, was made. I guess I have to agree with the other people talking. I don't know how long how long this will be, but um, please reconsider that. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm finished. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Podowitz. Okay, next we have Laura, and we should be able to hear you now. Please state your full name and municipality. Hi, my name is Laura Pendergast, and I live in Cherry Hill. Um, I can you hear me okay? Hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. Can you hear me okay? There's just an echo. Hold on one moment. If All right, is this better? Speaker, that might be part of the echo. Um, is this any better here? Much better. Okay. Um, I am calling to um, encourage the district to maintain their commitment to anti racism. Uh, I'm really proud and encouraged by the work that the CPS committee is doing. Um, we've really been a leader in the state with our African American studies course. Um, I'm so excited that my children are going to get to benefit from that. And the curriculum is in line with best practices and um, the, you know, and the research in African American studies. Um, the experts are true experts in their field, and I that um, were consulted. And I really am just grateful for the work Cherry Hill is doing. I think it's benefiting my kids. I have kids. Um, I have a child at Barkley and I have a child at Russell Knight. And I've consistently found the staff to be culturally sensitive, trauma-informed, um, and have are teaching my kids really important social-emotional skills that they'll use throughout their lives. So I just want to say thank you, um, and please continue this great work. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Carolina Bevitt. Good evening, Carolina Bevid, Cherry Hill. I would just like to echo that um, limiting public comment to one hour is disappointing, especially after increasing access by allowing um, virtual comments, which was a big step forward. Limiting public comment to one hour seems like a big step back. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mindy. Hi, Mindy Rosen, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I also want to echo the sentiments of people who have spoken to the one hour limit. And I'd like to know whose decision was it to make this decision to limit, it, limit comments to one hour? Thank you. Thank you, Mindy. Okay, so no other public comments. We do have items for the second executive session this evening. However, no action will be taken this evening. And I would like to make a motion to go to, the, oh, apologies, Dr. Malosh. It's underneath the second public comment for superintendent comments, second superintendent comments. Apologies. That's okay, Ms. Neary, thank you. Uh, just a couple of items in response to comments that were made this evening. Um, again, comments that are made at the microphone by members of the public. Uh, regarding masks or COVID or things like that. Certainly our public comments, they are not stated, endorsed, uh, or backed up by the school district or by the Board of Education. Those are individual members of the public. Uh, those are not statements that have been um, backed or supported by folks that are here. Um, thank you to everybody that called in and that came down to uh, speak. Thank you to the people that have been participating in the discussions um, about the school improvement planning. Uh, let me reiterate again, as strongly as I can, there is not a bond that's been constructed um, saying that the bond is going to fail or talking about the bond failing, talking about the bond existing uh, is very premature. The bond has not yet been constructed. That's why we are doing these meetings and having the discussions. 
think that is, I think that's it. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, so that brings me back again to a motion to go into second executive session. Do I have a second? Okay, Mrs. Stratton, all in favor? Okay, great, thank you. Have a good evening.